Uh, Joe Sasika is going to tell us about the TV channel repack. I have a friend of mine that builds the antennas for this business, and he tried to explain it to me, and I got lost really, really fast. Uh, I'm a two-way radio guy. I didn't quite understand broadcast. I've looked at Joe's slides. You will understand it thoroughly when he finishes. Joe. Okay, thank you, and uh, thanks for having me at the Radio Club Symposium. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think I'll be near as entertaining as Dr. Bruckner. Uh, <laughs> And, and the only chance I might have is if I tried to play the piano, but since my brother stuck with the lessons and I went to play with the stereo, um, that wouldn't work either. So anyway, and I'm, I'm also, I'd like to, uh, I was a bit inspired by, by the video and youth program, um, so I want to augment my bio ver verbally a bit in that I'm a graduate of Michigan Technological University, okay, and I was president of the radio club. It was the Michigan Tech Amateur Radio Club, now the Husky Radio Club, for, for two years. So that was very good to see in the presentation. And by the way, he's outside in the, showing you the snow when it's starting to melt, which is when you want to go outside. Um, because in my junior year of college there, we got 327 inches of snow. <laughs> That's over 27 feet, if we all say you, you do the math. It's luckily not on the ground all at the same time. It sublimates or whatever, but nonetheless, it seems like snow is an everyday thing from uh, September 30th to April 1st. And I even went to school one summer to catch back up, and it was snowing on campus in July. It didn't stick. Nonetheless, I saw snow in July, okay? So, um, a little bit about the TV channel repack and uh, try to get into some, some uh, details here of how things go, a little bit of drudgery between uh, perhaps a couple of very interesting presentations, but hopefully you'll understand what's going on um, out there in, in, in the, the TV world. Um, so a little bit of a brief history of the TV ban. Um, probably a lot of you know this. Originally it was VHF only. We had channels 1 through 19, okay? And if any of you are old enough to remember having a TV with a dial on it, I always wondered how come it quit at 2. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the TV my, my folks had or whatever, it, it stopped at 2, you know? It didn't have a number 1 on it, okay? Um, you know... So originally there was a channel one, so it's not a not a, it's not an anomaly. Yeah. Um, so the band wasn't contiguous. There, there was FM allocations and others, and channel one became problematic and was moved around to try to make it work. And it was eventually eliminated circa 1940 due to problems with uh, IFs being used in TV receivers on the same frequency or very close by at at 45 megahertz. Uh, which was a common IF for TV receivers and also a common IF for television modulator exciters and transmitters, um, except some of the, the, my company uh, used the 37 megahertz IIF and it probably has basis in getting away from 45. Okay. Um, the UHF band was allocated in 1952, um, 470 to 890, not 806 as many of us probably have come to um, uh, know, and it was up to channel 83, all right? Channel 7383 was eliminated uh, for the advanced mobile phone system in 1983. So maybe that's our first repack, but maybe there wasn't a lot to repack. It's essentially just we're going to lop this off the chart, and uh, you know I don't know who actually had to move at that time. Um, then channel, very recently here, channel 52 to 69 was eliminated um, by the Telecommunic Telecommunications Act of 1996 that authorized what we know as today's digital television, 8VSB, okay? Um, however, that spectrum was not reclaimed until mid-2009, all right? So things that are in the broadcasting industry and government regulated, they tend to have a long timeline to them. And I'll get in a couple other things that will illustrate the, the long timeline here. Um, next bullet, actually. The National Broadband Plan of 2010. It's, it's seven years later. Okay, so the National Broadband Plan of 2010 
is the law that set up the repack that we're now beginning to execute. That's how long it takes to churn through all this stuff. Okay? Um, the spectrum was sought to satisfy the projected, at the time, projected demand on mobile broadband. And as we talked earlier in an earlier presentation about cord cutters, cord cutting, um, people will cut the cord, give up cable. Nobody seems to be willing to give this up. No. Nobody. Okay? In my neighborhood, I have a giant Blonox Tower WLW AM700 that is now part of a very nice modern community. People drive up to the door and ask the engineer, when are you going to take this down? It's ugly. It's an eyesore. What is this? Sorry you didn't see it when you were looking at your house. <laughs> it's, been here, it's been here for about 100 years. Okay, But nobody seems to object to having a cell tower go up next to them because it's in their hand. You take away something from personally if you did that. It's, 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 that's the feeling. Um, so the UHF spectrum was highly sought after for a couple of reasons. It's excellent propagation characteristics that we all know of, and also poten potential large continuous, contiguous blocks of spectrum. Um, even though LTE can stitch together non-contiguous blocks into virtual contiguous blocks at the time, hey, we need a big block of spectrum that, that can work for this. So at the time, UHF TV accounted for about 30% of spectrum allocation between 225 megs and one gig. So there's a lot of spectrum there that was just ripe if you're in the right, right area. Um, so recognizing that some economic groups are relying on over-the-air TV, and it's long served as an important part of our communications infrastructure serving the public interest, it was determined that we needed a voluntary market-based mechanism to reclaim the spectrum. We couldn't just go in eminent domain spectrum and shut TV down or shut certain things down. We needed to be market-based and make it work. So there was um, a lot of studies done on the economic and the technical capability to do this. Um, and these studies are from you know, 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, but one of the studies said that, concluded that mobile broadband has more potential value for the spectrum than broadcast. Essentially, they calculated a value gap of almost 10 times. Okay? That, that just goes to show you the value of 100 bucks a month times how many people uh, want broadband versus how many people are watching said broadcast in this same band. All right? So, What's the best value for the public? That's what the commission has to look out for. Um, and uh, ultimately, it was calculated that, you know, if you look at broadcast, um, and, and also there was another auction uh, that reclaimed those channels 52 to 69 after the original DTV transition, that auction for advanced wireless services raised over $19 billion. Okay. I personally think that that's a bit short-sighted on the part of the government, um, but they don't ask me. But if it's a publicly owned, everybody, the public, everybody owns it. it it's our thing, the electromagnetic spectrum. You auction it off, it's a one-time thing. What if they leased it? Were you a recurring revenue stream or whatever, but um, perhaps that doesn't fly in the, in the commercial marketplace. So wireless was con is considered to be much more better or valuable use of the spectrum here. And then if we look at where we're getting our programming, here in the US anyway, um, at the time of this slide, again, see it's 2010, uh, MVPDs, satellite cable, AT&T U-verse, whatever, um, people were getting, you know, three, three quarters of the people got their video or their television content from an MVPD versus 25, 24% relying on over-the-air TV. And you see this curve is just downward trending to 2010, saying at one time only 10% of people are relying on over-the-air TV to receive their TV. 90% get it from a paid source of somewhere. Um, well, this is your haves and haves and have-not kind of chart. Um, sometimes what confuses this number, though, is that there's a main television set or a couple of main television sets in a living room or a family room or a basement entertainment center, but there may be a, a, a bedroom, a bathroom TV, uh, that kind of a thing that actually just gets 
the local news in the morning from an antenna. That's, that's not reflected in this number. Um, and so it's kind of graphically represented over here in this chart uh, from year 2000 or so. But if we, this doesn't take the cord cutter uh, effect into account because of the time of the chart. So there might be a little bit of an uptick in broadcast and a little bit of downtick in MVPD if we looked at today's stats. And that's, typical, that's what you read in the press. Okay, so there was an incentive auction authorized by Congress in 2012, five years ago, okay? There were actually two auctions in one. There was a reverse auction where broadcasters could say, I'll go, they had three options. I'll go off the air, I'll turn my license in. I'll go to high VHF, channel seven through 13 long considered beachfront spectrum for television broadcasting. I'll go to high VHF. Um, but you could be incentivized more, say, well, I'll go to low VHF. Because remember that 90% chart, you know, um, people get me from an MVPD anyway. So as long as I'm radiating something, I'm technically a broadcaster and people get my content somewhere else. What if my propagation is tough on VHF? Well, that's an old problem because now the penetration of cable and internet and over the top, that's what I'll do. So they could like to do that. So what, there were rules in terms of their uh, amount of spectrum to be reclaimed and the amount of money from it. Originally, they wanted 120 or 126 megahertz of spectrum. And they didn't meet the dollar value amount. Not enough people put in. I mean, that's a lot of television stations saying, I'll go out of business, okay? So there were several rounds to the auction. And ultimately, it ended up closing where they're reclaiming 84 megahertz of spectrum. So. There were, there were rules to meet, be, have a successful auction. Uh, it settled at 84 megahertz reclaimed. That's essentially channel 38 to 51 being reclaimed, okay? Channel 37 remains um, a guard band. So after the broadcasters had their successful reverse auction and they knew who was going to go on V or go, or go to V or go, out, go off the air, the wireless bidders could then bid in the forward auction on the spectrum that was out there, okay? So that was the forward auction to expand their services. They could bid on newly available 600 megahertz spectrum. And part of these proceeds from this auction fund the broadcaster relocation fund. Uh, more on that in a second. So at first, the broadcasters, who was eligible? Not, not necessarily everybody was eligible. Um, so, you know, the FCC wanted as, as Originally, like I said, 120 megahertz of spectrum. Um, and many of the largest markets were going to be the, the place where you need it. And early on, it was like, you know, where, where is spectrum really crowded? Not Montana, New York, Connecticut, Eastern Seaboard, Northeast. That's where the spectrum is most needed and the most crowded. It was like, this is a non starter. Okay. But Ultimately, it, it was made to work, and there's also a ripple effect. Uh, I was recently in, in a uh, broadcast show in Indiana, and I thought that Indiana was far enough west that they wouldn't be that much affected. 30 of 34 stations in Indiana are repacked. 30 of 34. Okay? And Indiana... Uh, is in, in here, okay? They are considered, depending on if you're in Indianapolis, Indianapolis is, is considered uh, an interference. They have to calculate interference to Canada. Okay? So based on FCC's interference criteria and propagation and so on and so on, um, you wouldn't think of Indiana having the chance to interfere with Canada, but nonetheless, it's there. So these, these were the potential reverse auction markets. You can see that it is highly concentrated in the eastern seaboard, but you have ripple effect here in what's called an adjacent market. So, you know, while New York City, uh, of course, is being affected, uh, you also ripple over into, uh, you know, to the, to the west. Um, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Columbus, that impacts uh, down to West Virginia and Kentucky. Who would have thought? Okay, but if you look at the, I'll have a phase chart coming up uh, in a minute, but if you look at what's, what's happening, um, 
there are a lot of logistics going on that you look at and say, well, this is crazy, all right? So where I live in Cincinnati, a lot of the Cincinnati stations are being repacked, and then Dayton is a market just a little bit north. You all know Dayton, right? Uh, um, a lot of the Dayton stations are getting repacked onto frequencies that Cincinnati stations had to get off of. Okay, um, but there are you know rules. Or there there are stations that are linked. You have to move. They have to move. The, we have to move, and. To just sit back and say, well, look, why don't we stay here? You stay there. Call your buddy up. Let's file this. No. no. It would not necessarily work. There is a lot of behind-the-scenes math at work on interference and contours and everything, different patterns, antenna patterns, to make it all go together. So in, in the end of days, we cleared 84 megahertz from the TV band. Um, broadcasters got 10 billion for their efforts, okay? So those broadcasters that chose to go off the air, go to V, um, totaled $10 billion. The wireless companies bid $20 billion on the reclaimed spectrum. So being that this clearing target was met, the dollar amount was met, the FCC had a stage rule that says, hey, green light, we're done. Now the fun begins. Um, so just as a, as a kind of a bit of an eye-opener, when this chart came out in, um, I think well, this was April, um, from the public notice, who was the win big winners at the auction? We, all of us, went to number two right away. WNBC New York's going off the air. Holy cow, you know. No, no way, that can't be. No, they're not. Okay, NBC also owns Spanish network Telemundo. Telemundo had a better frequency of, that already existed and whatever, and you know, if you think of it, this is an incentive auction. It's like, we're in New York City, we have another channel, we can give up one channel, we can share, we do this, and what, what, you know, what can we get for it? $200 million. That's a good gig if you can get it, I guess. Um, so all of us were surprised that the Chicago station, uh, uh, you know, a religious broadcaster, they're the biggest winner at 300 million, okay? And, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lots, of, lots of stations that, uh, uh, 175 total. So 175 stations chose to either go off the air or move to low VHF or move to high VHF. So, um, you know, we didn't get a lot of stations saying, We'll, we'll relinquish our spectrum, but enough to make it work to get 180 or 84 megahertz back. Okay, so there's a lot of money there to to some stations who are struggling and could really use it. So now that that's all said and done, we get to go into the actual repacking process. Again, 84 megahertz recovered. Highest remaining TV channel is 36. Um, there are 593 stations that are directly impacted, full power stations. Uh, 144 that are, have Class A licenses, and uh, that totals 737 stations that are directly impacted. Um, so some, some participate in the auction, therefore reduce, reduce that number a bit. A little bit of a different look at it. 30 stations move into VHF. 17 low band, 13 high band. Um, some countries like UK uh, got smart, if you will, several years ago and don't use VHF for television anymore. We still do. If any of you have a much better use of VHF spectrum, please propose it. But now that we've, <laughs> now that we've constricted UHF, I'm not sure that we, we'd get there. Um, Stations relocated within 917 stations. There are single frequency networks for 8VSB or ATSC1. Some people think it's not possible. It is possible. They have to be very carefully engineered. And they're very reliant on having a good equalizer in the receiver. There are 19 distributed transmission or single frequency network type 
stations out there. Well, that's the number of transmitters, okay? Um, there's 19 transmission sites that need to be re relocated. Within VHF, there's 70 that have to play the shell game. And you'd have thought maybe they could just sit still and add a new station in. Well, no. Somebody has to clear out, change a pattern, move interference, somebody else moves in. Um, there's, there's a lot, a lot uh, to go on there. 62 of our Canadian neighbors are forced to relocate. No, they don't get any reimbursement. They don't get to participate in the reimbursement fund. They have to fund this themselves. Canada has never, uh, as a matter of government policy or whatever, reimbursed broadcasters for anything they've had to do. So it's just, you want to be in the business, that's the cost, you figure out a way, okay? Um, I don't have anything on here with respect to Mexico because as of this time, as far as I know, Mexico would not fairly negotiate with the commission and so forth on the spectrum treaty and whatever. And so I guess that's a big uh, asterisk on just how we're going to handle things in Texas and California, and Arizona, New Mexico, and so on. But Mexico notwithstanding, we've got over a thousand stations repacked. We didn't have that much more to begin with. All right, so what if you're not changing a channel? What if you decided not to put in the auction? I'm on, I'm, I'm below channel 36, I'm on channel 31. Um, I don't wanna participate, I'm just gonna stay in business. Can I be impacted? Yes, in more ways than one. A lot of stations now share a tower with another broadcaster. Or they're on a tower, they don't have their own tower anymore. They, they have a lease agreement with a company such as American Tower, Vertical Bridge, okay? They will be impacted. Even if they're not moving frequencies, there will be work going on around them. Um, at the recent IEEE uh, broadcast symposium, a uh, uh, consulting engineer named Matt Sanderford was working on a repack job already underway in Texas, and there was somebody who wasn't in on the auction, but he was on the tower. And this station refused to turn the power down or go the extra mile to help him. He says, no, you got a window, you know, 2 to 4 a.m., good luck. I guess they can do that, but when the shoe's on the other foot, they're gonna regret it. Um, so if there's a stacked tower top antenna, they could be affected, uh, the, the shared antenna I mentioned. Um, FM stations are commonly on a shared tower. You can't climb through their aperture at full power, they're gonna have to go down in power, go to aux or something to go work on that tower. And if, the, the tower loading for the new TV antennas and so forth says that, you know what, we need to get rid of that FM antenna. They might have to relocate. And they won't get reimbursed for doing it. Okay? So, w I got another slide coming up about who's gonna help pay for that. Um, right, as of right now, they have to pay for it. So this is the new, the new UHF band plan. Um, we have channel 37 for radio astronomy and other uses um, that uh, remains as a guard band between television broadcast and the new wireless band. Um, and uninteresting, uh, wireless is in five megahertz pairs, you know, TVs remains in six megahertz channels. Um, the reason I really put this slide in here is that you know, there's a guard band of uh, spectrum between services. See, the, the wireless people get a guard band from radio astronomy, but broadcasters don't get a guard band on channel 14 from land mobile radio at all. Okay, and there's also the band channel 14, that's a few, uh, few channels um, that actually share land mobile radio with broadcast, just depending on the market, all right? But in general, um, there is no guard band here between 470 and land mobile and television. It's, it's just, it's a brick wall, okay? And um, so channel 14 was avoided like the plague. There were people that were assigned channel 14, they got moved off channel 14, that kind of a thing. But when you reduce the spectrum, there's gonna be winners and losers, so to speak. So, there were 20 full power assignments before repack. Eight of them won the lottery and got repacked off. I said, oh, that's great, we're getting off of that channel. Um, 12 of them remain on channel 14, all right? 
but there are 30 new assignments in channel 14. That's the, 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 the reason that's difficult is the, the, R, the RF filtering that's required at the output of the transmitter to protect the LAN mobile radio receivers, okay? So it's, the, it's essentially the new service, the burden is on the television broadcaster to make sure that he does not interfere with any land mobile radio that is already in the band down there, okay? Thought I'd show this to show you how just big and burly a channel 14 filter can get to solve that problem. And so there, there's, there's a, you know, humanoids here to give you scale, all right? So this thing that looks like a locomotive engine is the actual bandpass filter for channel 14. Um, and then we've got, you know, waveguide elbow to go around to ultimately fold under and hit, hit these resonant cavities, all right? These resonant uh, slide of interest. If you've never seen a WR1800 circulator that'll take like 30 kilowatts, that's what one looks like. So it's WR1800 waveguide, um, ferrite circulator, there's your reject load port, and there's your forward RF energy port. They exist, they're quite finicky, uh, they have to warm up and stabilize, otherwise they'll reflect power back to the transmitter. But this was put in back at this time because um, this is an inductive output tube transmitter, IOT transmitter, and the tubes do not like reflected power whatsoever. So having the circulator uh, isolates it from uh, this singular reflective style filter cavity. A lot, of, a lot of TV mask filters were built with a uh, hybrid split and it, any reflected energy off the filter would come back, be 90 degrees out of phase in the hybrid and go into reject load. But in, in this case, that was not feasible, so they had to put in that circulator. So um, I thought I had a slide in there. I guess I, but, yeah. <coughs> Each of these cavities is a notch filter for a specific land mobile radio frequency that this station has to protect for. So um, I don't have a blow up of it, but each of those little white stickers on there has the frequency of note. So essentially uh, we go through the bandpass filter and then we loop around and we go through a section of notches to just further protect uh, the land mobile radio that's, that's down, down there. Okay, so we're going to have 30 new assignments and people with those problems and every one of them is unique. Every one of them is unique to the land mobile radio profile in their market. Okay, so that's going to be a, you know, bag of kittens. So we're on the clock here. These are the construction phases that the, the commission put out um, as part of the public notice. And uh, phase one, well, all of them, were, we, you know, this, this is approximately where we are today. We're running, we're, we're, we're repacking, okay? So um, what a person down here, a station down here in phase eight, um, if they're ready or they can just kind of get it done for a couple weeks worth of work, um, go ahead, get done. And then the facility has to sit idle until you get out to the test phase essentially, okay? Um, because other people have to go and make way for you and, and that kind of a thing. So in phase one, we got 94 stations, phase 214, 95, 110, you know, you take them in little chunks, you say, yeah, it might be doable. But if you look at the schedule, this is a perfect Gantt chart. November 30th, 2018, this phase stops, and December 1, this test phase opens for phase two. Um, you know, June 21, this phase stops, you know, June 22nd, this test phase begins for phase four, all right? How many ever managed a project with a Gantt chart like that that didn't move as you got into it? <laughs> I'll say, I, you know, not too many, right? Um, so anyway, it's, a, it's quite, a, a, uh, quite a feat in front of us, 39 months to do this. And as unrealistic as it may seem, you say, who, who, would, who would do this? You know, who, who would put together a program that, that common sense says or industry people say it can't be done? The wireless people made it a mandatory condition of the auction to hold a successful auction. You've got to clear this ban. You've got to clear it in this time frame. 
or we're not going to bid, or we're not going to pay as much. You want our money, you make the schedule. Okay? So National Broadband Plan being what it is, it, they just had to execute. Um, so now reality sets in. Um, these are the repack regions. Um, interestingly, uh, what is it? Uh, the only state that I don't see a dot is Wyoming. One of the biggest winners of the wireless auction was T-Mobile. T-Mobile has already fired up some of their advanced services in guess where? Wyoming, <laughs> Wyoming right? So um, they're, they're, uh, they're very aggressive on this. So in the uh, timeline of, uh, that the broadcasters had, the public, the public notice came out April 13th. They were given till July 12th to file their construction permits. Basically, they were given, in, back in January, a confidential letter from the commission on what their outcome was going to be and make plans for that and that kind of a thing. And they had an assignment for a channel, a coverage, an ERP, and that kind of a thing. And um, if they agreed with all of that, said, OK, sure, we'll take that, that channel, that pattern, that power, uh, based on the FCC Office of Engineering Technologies study, um, you have to file and get a construction permit. And then the FCC said they'd process it pretty quickly. Um, if you weren't seeking to expand your coverage beyond what we, we, the FCC, said or assigned to you, and if you were seeking authorization for no more than 5% smaller than what was specified. So if you just kind of agreed with what was handed down, file in this period, get a construction permit, and then once it's approved, go to work. Well, there was a first priority window that just recently closed that they opened up for um, broadcasters and it was limited to broadcasters that were deemed unable to construct as, as it was assigned um, due to extraordinary technical or legal circumstances. And the commission themselves, after the notice went out, found 25 stations that were unable to construct and they gave them a waiver to this deadline. Okay. Um, so they had the, that priority to put in to say we can't construct for, for whatever reason. Um, and I got an example coming up. Um, so if they were going to predict, if they were going to experience a loss in coverage or viewership in excess of 1%, um, non-repacked, if they would experience a loss, and if class A stations were displaced and eligible for protection, they could put in in this window to get some changes made. Okay. So who would have used this window? Um, station in, um, I think it's Vermont or New Hampshire, on a ski resort. Um, they have one VHF and one UHF on a stacked antenna array, okay? The site has restrictions because it's in a park for no new tower or antenna construction, okay? So they can't put up an interim antenna. Also, the way the phases were set, they would have had to lift the top antenna, take this antenna out, put that antenna back, then do the work, and then go out and put up a new antenna. It's like, look, this just doesn't work, okay? We can't put up anything new or whatever. so. Um, they applied in that priority window and basically said, let's change, change, can we be in the same phase, please, so that we can coordinate our work? That's who would have put in there. But the, the commission, the, those little details are kind of things that maybe the, the commission couldn't see or didn't, didn't know about, that this was a stack and they couldn't have a new antenna and that kind of a thing. So um, that's who would have filed in that, that priority window. There was a second window that just recently closed. Um, so if this was for stations that wanted to essentially what's called maximize, get um, you know, bigger coverage than they have, they were assigned, um, or swap with another market, in-market station. But be, stations were warned here that, hey, if you choose an alternate channel, then we've assigned you. Uh, that's a major change. It's got to go to public notice, and uh, people can petition to deny. You'd be very careful what you ask for. Um, and then there's a topic called mutual exclusivity that, for interference concerns that has to be uh, uh, accounted for. Then, if there's unforeseen circumstances during the construction period, if you're unable to construct by the phase completion deadline, or if a uh, station is unable to cease operation on the pre-auction channel, <laughs> Uh, you have to propose a creative solution. They, just, they didn't let stations just throw their hands up and say, oh, this is impossible, fix this for me. No, no, you got to do your homework and figure out how to do it. Um, 
Station can seek a single extension up to 180 days. It's got to be filed at least 90 days before the deadline. And the station can seek additional time beyond 180, only, 180 days, only pursuant to what the FCC's term <coughs> tolling, acts of God, delays due to administrative or judicial review. I don't know if any of you remember in the original DTV conversion out in Denver, things were behind by two or three years because of a uh, local park and zoning. This is, you can't do anything out here, okay? So judicial review. And here's the real thing. Extending that deadline does not extend your phase completion date. Unless the station is granted a special temporary authority or otherwise, the date the station has to cease operation on its pre-auction channel is the phase completion date. That says go off air. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit short on time, so I'll just, uh, just real quick on the reimbursement thing. Uh, stations will be reimbursed for their repack expenses up to 80% commercial, up to 90% non-commercial, that's PBS broadcasters, um, but it's subject to how much the, the uh, uh, actual requests match up to the 1.75 billion repack fund. Um, and the total submissions are over 1.75. That's 2.1 stations estimate they'll take, okay? So they're gonna exhaust the fund. Um, will Congress take some action? Yes, there's the Viewer Protection Act introduced by Frank Pallone in July to create a uh, billion dollars additional, um, fund a $90 million viewer education effort, um, reimburse FMs, you know, basically make, make the whole thing whole. It has, it has bipartisan support in Congress, so we, we hope it goes through. Then there is the Viewer and Pro Listener Protection Act. So, difference, rep, Senator, okay? So in the House and in the Senate, there have been bills introduced with bipartisan support to, uh, you know, very, very concerned rural America or people, uh, rural America be disproportionately harmed. There needs to be adequate resources and appropriate timeline. Uh, we got to cover this gap. We got to protect stations from going off the air because one of the things the FCC always has as a test criteria at the very end is, is this in the public interest? Okay. So is it in the public interest to tell that station to cease broadcasting until they get everything squared away? Um, it's a bit of a test. There's gonna be a big demand on tower resources. You know, that picture that Mike had in his presentation, those two guys on a tower? Not everybody likes to do that kind of work, okay? It takes specialized resources. And it also takes specialized resources to climb tall broadcast towers versus a cellular tower. So there's going to be a huge impact on these crews. And, uh, you know, just in September, we had three people killed on a tower in Miami doing repack work. All right? There aren't that many of them to begin with. All right? This is dangerous work. We lost people during the original DTV conversion. Um, we've already lost three people doing repack work. Um, you know. I don't wonder if they'll reassess the deadline. So far, no word on that. So one of the tower companies that, that leases tower space, American Tower Corporation, they estimate that once we get into here about phase three or so, and we got some stations in phase one that are repacking, and some in phase two that are repacking, and we get the phase three out of resources. Every, everybody that's qualified to do this kind of work is gonna be busy. So that goes to, the story of the Gantt chart pushing out in the end, notwithstanding any hurricanes next year or any other natural disaster or whatever, or, you know, uh, let's hope we don't have any, any more fatalities. So to wrap up here, this isn't broadcasting's first rodeo, uh, but it is different in that, unlike in the DTV transition where everybody got a second channel to simulcast for a period of years, there's no second channel. Okay, you just gotta build this whole new facility, switch it, all right? Um, everybody believes it's gonna take longer than scheduled. Um, the original DTV conversion that finished in 2009 took three years longer than originally planned. It was supposed to originally be done in 2006, okay? And we've got less time to do essentially maybe a little bit more complicated work. Um, you know, moving antennas down and tower work and reinforcement or whatever, that doesn't, that didn't get sped up. There's no Moore's Law for that, okay? Um, that's just people in talent with the right, right gear. 
it's going to cost more than we budgeted. And you know, repurposing a spectrum to higher value use is an ongoing pursuit. We see it every day in, in different things. And uh, recently heard a speaker from the uh, Defense Department talking about sharing spectrum. He says, you know, we have, this, we have this mentality that this spectrum is for broadcast, this spectrum is for mobile radio, this spectrum is for this, this spectrum is for that. He says, you know, that doesn't necessarily work. There's, it's, it's just too finite anymore. There's too much communication going on. So if you're in Alabama and, you know, you're in a site and, in a, you know, there's an issue with a military use and there's no TV broadcast in it, why, why can't we use it? You know, and it goes up in the microwaves as well. It's not just a TV problem. It's just the RF electromagnetic spectrum problem. So, you know, I'd like to leave you with that, that there is something with spectrum sharing in our future, just like this wireless microphone thing over here is currently set on channel 28. We're spectrum sharing TV channel 28 with this wireless microphone. And if a Pittsburgh station repacked in the 28 and went on air 12 minutes ago, they would have blown me off. Okay, so the real everyday things. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there is a sharing issue also with radar. There's a lot of work being done on sharing the uh, carbon with radar frequencies. Okay. So it's yeah, it's 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 everywhere. I mean, there's no, there's only so much spectrum. So, yes. Joe, do you see this as the beginning of the demise of UHF broadcast television? It sure, looks like that to me. Uh, well, it's the third demise, if you will. Um, and I think while we can tend to hang our heads and think yes, um, ultimately broadcasting does a public service. And, uh, Not you know. Stop <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's still to the point of working. I mean, you know, we can get so much in a, in a six megahertz channel now that we couldn't get when it was analog. I mean, the only thing you got was that program, right? So uh, with the efficiency and spectrum and, and reuse and, and, and so on that we can get multiple programs in, uh, hopefully it's not the death of it. And like I say, it's, it's, a, it's a vital part of infrastructure, the U.S. broadcasting uh, spectrum. Well, what got me thinking about this was <coughs> I heard the presentation about NPCS-1, and that was the zippity doo -dah, unbelievable technology then. 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you're up here now. 10 years from now, you could be up here speaking to us again about the four trillion cell phones they have to add to the spectrum. And that's what I'm wondering about. It. Yeah, but the, the, one of the things with uh, cell phones, well, and, and that's if you look at the 5G cellular, um, it, 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 yeah, but like f five, 5G cellular uh, is, you know, femto cells and nano cells and it, super, super high frequencies that just don't propagate from, you know, me to the wall, that kind of a thing. And broadcasting, you know, has a large coverage and interference zone. So perhaps maybe the next thing in, in broadcasting is to go to a, a, a smaller cellular type approach of broadcasting, a statewide single frequency network of who knows what, right? But there are other technologies that we can potentially mold and shape the, the future in, but you might be handing it off someday. Maybe, okay. you know, I some some people have asked us like, what if uh, what if Verizon bought Disney? You know, <laughs> things like that. You know, that could just really change things. Thank you. Hmm. One more question. This will be the last one. Uh, there was a station channel three in Nevada, and somehow they're able to relocate that station to New Jersey without any competing applications or anything? Is, was that part of repacking? This was fairly recently that this happened. No, I don't think so. I think that was a, a legal loophole, and, and my colleague Mike can better answer that than I can. I, the legal loophole was something about every, it goes way back, every state had to have a UHF, had to have a VHF channel. And somehow they figured out that, hey, New Jersey had no more VHF channels and they needed one there. So they took it from the bottom. Joe, thank you very much. All right, thanks.